Sorry, that was just a mistake by me. Um, uh, James, can I come to you about the youth turnout? Yeah, I mean, you know, just sort of adding to, to what Dame Margaret said, I mean, I think that the, um, I mean, there's a lot, I mean, what, what conservatives want to do instinctively because of their ideolo ideology is ignore um, structural inequalities that exist, for example, structural racism, because they believe um, it's all about personal wickedness. And so you can get away with um, the people believing that there are these policemen in the, in the Met who are um, somehow um, bad apples and that the institution's fine, which was you know, why <laughs> the problem that they'd got into um, quite recently. Um, I think that the issue, of, I mean, thanks for the question. I mean, I think the issue of um, getting young voters to turn out, I mean, I think it's going to be perhaps more of a challenge um, than under Corbyn, because I think Corbyn had authenticity. I, I'm not saying that Keir Starmer doesn't have it, but I don't think people quite understand where it is, um, because he hasn't so is he a human rights guy? Well, he sort of is. And, you know, he did a lot of great work um, um, in terms of institutional racism and Doreen Lawrence inquiry. So, you know, he does have, there's something there, but I think he's a bit sort of, I don't know if he's cautious at articulating it or he just hasn't sort of found his voice yet. Um, I think for young people getting them out to vote, um, the Labour Party has to sort of talk about I mean, Dame Margaret talked about hope, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it's hope, it's opportunity. I don't know how you package it. Do you call it the great Green New Deal? Incidentally, when we go back to Scotland, that's a good way to get the SNP, isn't it? Because independence depends on them feasting on um, fossil fuels after <laughs> Scotland's become independent, but yet they're in coalition with the um, Green Party, which is kind of a weird one, right? Um, but I think that, um, so where is the, where are the values then for young people? Is it about um, we're going to offer young people all over the country um, a new deal. I don't know, whatever you call it, uh, a green new deal, um, some element of hope. We're trying to sort of build a new social contract. I'm, I'm not sure how it works in terms of the mess messaging. Um, people here will be better than I am at that. Um, but then again, you know, how do you then mobilize? So part of it is about the message and having the characters there. Part of it is about mobilization. And I think that... Um, again, um, young people need to really um, be proactive about sort of mobilizing um, the message of opportunity or hope or anti-poverty or, you know, whatever it is, because they need to be sort of proactive about getting their friends to mobilize, because it's not going to be an older person or a politician, probably, um, who's going to get young people out to vote. It's going to be other young people. And it's these peer networks um, that work in terms of collective action. And so if one of your friends tells you to go out and vote, it'll be much more effective than if a politician does. Um, and that seems to be how things um, work nowadays. The bigger challenge is, can they get those young red wall people or the young people who don't vote um, or you know, tend to be put off politics? And for that, you know, that is a bigger challenge. And I think for that, you really need to go to the local because I don't think, um, I think trust is so low um, in politicians um, amongst um, young people who come from deprived backgrounds, whether they're ethnic minorities in London or whether they're um, young white men in um, up, up in Northern England. Um, trust is so low um, that you really do have to get this going, this mobilization going at a local level or it's not gonna work. Whereas I think the internet mobilization will work with highly educated people and it can be really effective tool. Um, as you saw in the climate strikes of getting people out, if you have a, a nice, strong message of opportunity, hope, um, maybe something to do with, I was writing down ideas, maybe something about um, opportunity versus privilege, right? Um, there's a lot of priv pr privilege and um, cronyism going on and replace that with opportunity and hope for young people. I think that that creates quite a good message, whether it's Boris or maybe Rishi Sunak, who knows? <laughs> Um, as the um, prime minister, you know, where, wherever you look, there's privilege in um, that party. I mean, there's maybe a few exceptions, but not many. Um, just, just as a sort of, sorry, slight anecdote, but I was trying to set up an ethnic minority placement for Royal Holloway students. <laughs> and I was trying to do it um, for Labour Party and Conservative Party, you know, to try and make it balanced, because I'm a politics lecturer, I'll try, try and appeal to, um, the Conservative Party wouldn't, 
none of the ethnic minority MPs in the Conservative Party, all of my, them I spoke to um, went to um, private school. None of them would admit that it was a sort of issue that you needed to get ethnic minority um, people in there. So I just ended up with um, these placements for Royal Holloway ethnic minority students with um, Labour MPs in London. And, you know, for me, that's really kind of disappointing. But then that also shows you, so your generation, apart from having suffered from these waves of um, crisis, economic crisis, apart from uh, being very highly educated, are also very ethnically diverse. And that's kind of interesting. And so, you know, maybe, you know, maybe that's another um, feature that you want to sort of work on re really is the sort of implicit racism, to be quite honest, in a lot of the stuff that's come out of um, this government, um, whether it's um, Boris himself um, or other members of the government. I think that's, you know, that's something to work on as well. I mean, it, it is an identity issue. And also, if I would say that, well, why do so many young women vote Labour? It's not an issue in older generations. Men and women are more or less even in older generations. Why do so many young women vote Labour compared to young men? Well, it's because of this um, amongst the Conservative Party and other sort of right parties um, is trying to roll back um, the rights of women that have been, <laughs> been a long fight um, over many decades and centuries. And I think, you know, that's um, another sort of really strong identity um, issue that you know Labour really needs to put forward because that's that's about opportunity as well. Can I just go? Uh, I, I, I've got to go in a minute because I'm I'm so I'm supposed to be in a phone call. But I, that James, for the first time, I don't agree with quite a lot of that. What was said there? I mean, I don't agree. You know, this is the, <laughs> this brings. I don't think that. Uh, I think Jeremy came in offering hope, but I think um, he. You know, the authenticity quite wore off, you know, the anti-racist who was anti-Semitic, yeah, the person yeah. who promised, um, uh, you, know, who, uh, you know, promised free broadband to everybody in a totally, you know, uh, uh, unbelievable way. Those were sort of things that he, that I think lost him his authenticity. And I do think of Keir Starmer, if you, if you juxtapose him with Boris Johnson, he is a guy who doesn't tell lies. You know, and there is sort of there's something around uh, uh, the trust that you can have in, in 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 somebody. You know, he may not be sort of uh, as charismatic as, as as Johnson is, but he he is honest. He's honest, and uh, uh, Johnson is a consummate liar. And I think the way that they're they're positioning those that two. So that's my first thing. I don't agree. You know, I think actually I often put Corbyn in as a populist in his own way in the same way that Trump and Johnson are, with a different set of, uh, of values that he, 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 uh, fought, he promoted, but populism as well. Populism of the left, which is as dangerous as populism of the right. And then the other thing I was going to say is, I think that the issue of hope is not one that is built on uh, encouraging division. So not you don't do it through the haves and the have-nots. And if you think about, what you know, Blair won three elections. I know people find this difficult to accept. He won three elections. And that's why I think you've got to go back to what he was trying to do and what he did. I talked about the social justice and economic prosperity being interlinked and, and two sides of the same cone. You can say tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, rights and responsibility. So he always, in his message of hope, built sort of by, you know, Build, bringing things together, not by drawing people apart. So I'm not sure that an agenda of hope, which exploits difference, is the way in which we uh, 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 build something which will make us attract, uh, sufficiently attractive to win the votes we need to form a government. And I'm really sorry, but I, I'm going to, I'm gonna, it's a quarter past and I'm, I've got no, it. Absolutely, we're very much. Well, we've been really pleased to have you. Thank you so much for your time. It's been fascinating. And we're going okay, to thank you. Thanks things. for the discussion. And it's been thank great to have you. Much. Thank you very much. Sorry, to, sorry, I'm going. No, no, please do. Bye. Um, so James, we'll come to you then with, with Finney's question before we finish up the session, just so I get we get the last question in. Finney, do you want to go and ask your go ahead and ask your question now? Yeah, we'll do. Um yeah, thanks James for coming. Um my question was really for the both of you, but um anyway, uh, it's about encouraging um more young people to stand as counsellors. Um in 2018, the average age of counsellors in England was uh, 59 um, and I think in 2018 just 15% of councillors were under the age of 45 
Um, and I think this lack of youth representation on councils is a real shame, um, particularly as there are so many issues that really affect young people, um, such as housing that councils have responsibility for. Um, so I was wondering um, what you think needs to be done to correct this and whether we need to reform the role of being a councillor uh, so that we can attract the best and brightest young talent um, to run for these councillor roles. I think it's a really great question because, um, we, you know, when I, so I used to do a lot on voter turnout and um, questions like that, but then I sort of started thinking, well, actually, what public policy is against younger generations you know and part of this is demographic because we're you know an aging population and you know there's going to be more money it's going to go on whether you know it's going to go on health care for older people it's going to go on social care you know that's kind of inevitable and you know so how do you actually do i mean it's interesting so you you look at well why do young people have an influence on public policy i've got a someone one of my students is from Zambia where the average age is 19 and it's like 40 over here it, you know there, there are huge um, differences and consequences and then that feeds through to um, councillors I think it's it's interesting I went to we we're in Runnymede which is quite a sort of rich-ish um, sorry um, um, sorry council and it's yeah, and I went to their away day representing my university and it was quite interesting sort of their sort of conversation. So everyone was, so I'm not quite 50, but everyone was older than me, so I felt quite good. Um, but, you know, the, where was the youth voice? And if you don't have a youth voice talking about um, issues, then it's all going to be about sort of daycare centres. And, you know, and cut, you know, that's obviously important, right? Um, but we're going through a mental health crisis um, young people aren't getting any mental health treatment you know it's it's that less than for older people it's kind of crazy I and mean, if i talk to people in in london the social uh, um young people in care i mean that is absolute you know disaster um social services have been run down um going on to that so i, I absolutely agree getting young people in, into councils it's absolutely critical how do you do it um uh, I'm working a little bit with Hounslow Council to try. I, I mean, I think councils actually would be quite welcoming of young people, to be honest, um, of young councillors, um, Labour Party and Conservative Party as well, to be fair. Um, but I think they they really don't understand how it works. They they do things like set meetings in the middle of the day because they're, they're all retired, you know, and no one who's like working or going to school or university can actually attend. It's like weird um, things like that. Um, how, do, how do you get what well, I think kind of think that um, young activists, you know, within the party, I think that is a pretty much an open door. I think you need to um, get them to um, give you some power um, locally to go out and get um, other young people um, to get involved and to actually give them some sort of proper role within a party. I mean, because if you, you know, it's probably some of you are involved in local politics, maybe most of you, um, but actually it wouldn't take very many of you to, to set up a quite a, a nice nucleus of young people. Um, I would start it with getting young people involved um, within your sort of local group, but in particular issues that they're concerned about within the community and start it that way and say, we as young labor within wherever you are um, in London, really wanna try and address this issue of housing or homelessness or whatever it is within our area. Let's come together within a meeting. They might be sort of people you know through your sort of social networks, get them together and do that as a starting bait, starting block and go, okay, let's like raise it um, with these councillors, um, bring them in. And I think you've got to start with the issues. Uh, it may be an issue of sort of racism in the police or the police not protecting um, women um, in London as well. Um, so, you know, there are some issues where you can draw people in and I think it's got to be having those sort of conversations and, you know, maybe some of them might not even be like real Labour um, supporters as, you know, most, very few, so in my politics degree at the beginning of the year, I always sort of ask the question, so who's a member of a political party? I don't ask which one it is because I'm trying to sort of protect them a little bit um, and it's very, very few and these are people who are interested in politics, well I hope they are because they're, you know, <laughs> stuck with us for three years if they're not um, it's going to be a long period of time um, and they so 
I think you've got to draw them in with the issues and go, we can solve something. Um, I want to get together a group within Labour who can solve an environmental issue, an issue in terms of policing and protection of women. And then that's almost the stepping stone for then, OK, um, out of us, let's put some people forward to be um, councillor within the local area. And I think that's that could be how it, how it would work in an ideal scenario, um, because I just think younger people are put off by um, politics, even, you know, I know some young Labour activists who, you know, find their council meetings, you know, <laughs> quite sort of difficult because of the preconceptions of the people they're working with. So I think, um, but, you know, you sort of kind of need the, count, the council that you're working with to sort of give you a bit of control and say, okay, if I get a group of young people, young Labour activists to work together on this issue, um, can you give us um, some money? Can you give us some resources? Can you give us some power? Um, and because I think when people go to these meetings and they realize nothing happens, then that is kind of a problem. You know? So, but yeah, it's a challenge, but I think if you work through your social networks, you can probably get there. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting answer. And I think um, <coughs> what I would add to that is, I think we need to make labor less professionalized. I think one big problematic shift is which shifted away from the unions and people who worked in, and now you get kind of carbon copies of young professionals who all think the same they come you know they're pretty wealthy they're London oriented and that's great but I think we need to you know build out and think about drawing more people in from different backgrounds um, so we've got to end uh, in, a, in a little while kind of sh shortly now C before um, we go can I ask you a final question about the next election and what you think will happen there. Does Labour have a chance or do you think we have to play the long game and we're looking at another Conservative government? Uh, I, I think you've always got to play the long game. I think uh, Margaret was, was alluding to that at the same time. Um, but I think that... I think your chart... I, I think there is a chance of winning, winning back. I mean, because I've got some... Um, one of my students has just joined the levelling up department. And believe me, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Um, they haven't got a clue. Um, and so they're sort of asking him and going, you know, what should we do, be doing about levelling up in London? Um, and um, I think there are going to be some dissatisfied Northern voters. So I think the red wall, there's, that's winnable. I, I do think, though, that, you know, Labour has to have a commitment to them. Um, some sort of a social contract. I don't know what you'd call it. You can probably all think of better um, names than that, but something, some sort of guarantee um, to them that it's going to be better under them after the Conservatives don't deliver it, which they won't. Um, I mean, even if they did it well, they couldn't deliver within that time frame. I mean, that's the reality of politics. Um, you know, they needed to start earlier if they were going to actually do it. And I, I think, you know, even some of those Northern Tory MPs are already getting quite nervous. Um, about it um i think within um i think you know i do agree with you joe about the point you were making it's probably easier for me to make this now um um margaret hodge isn't here but i think under new labor it did become quite professionalized and power was really centralized under um people like peter Mandelson, alistair campbell i mean i think it had to be to get into power um, and they were right to do that but i think that um, the social side of um, the Labour Party was kind of lost and it was a little became a little bit hollowed out and then it just became an election winning machine. And then when the coalitions weren't there, it suddenly um, or the economy tanked. Actually, that was the issue, wasn't it, really? The financial crisis uh, tanked in 2008. Then there was nothing there to sustain it and it just fell apart um, a little bit. Um, so I think that you know, you have a chance because the Conservatives are in a massive mess. And, you know, because they've the problem with populists is if populists get into government, um, they have to deliver, right? And they're not going to deliver in the North. Um, I think, obviously, COVID, I don't know. I mean, depends what comes out soon um, in the in various inquiries, but I think that's going to roll and roll. And there's been, you know, even it's interesting because new, newspapers, I was reading the Times today, um, traditional Tory newspaper, probably. Um, and there's a lot in there about um, corruption in the sort of contracts during COVID. And, you know, if you've got, you know, they're, they're in a little bit of trouble if the, um, you know, maybe because the Conservative um, newspapers feel safe because they're not worried about Labour. Um, but, 
you know, there's quite a lot that's undermining um, them as trustworthy. And, you know, maybe Margaret Hodge is right. I mean, I hadn't really thought about it in that much depth, but maybe that issue of trust and trustworthiness is one. Um, I also think, you know, if Boris does stay, everyone thinks, oh, Boris is so popular. Well, actually, he's one of the least popular um, candidates ever. Um, <laughs> Um, but just Jeremy Corbyn at last election was less popular. Um, you do need to um, think about getting older voters, though. I mean, I know this is, you know, to do with young young voters. Yeah, but... I think it's about lots of generations, so you know very much so. Sorry, go on. No, no, I mean, it, it, exactly. And I think it's those intergenerational sort of platforms. So I think there are certain things you can offer for young people, and I'm definitely getting them into sort of as counsellors and getting them involved and mobilising, I think is really important. But I, I kind of think that, you'd, you know, if you've, you're doing historically really amazingly well amongst young voters, or you did do it in the last couple of elections, then, you know, the Conservatives are doing historically amazingly well amongst older voters. So why do older voters not vote Labour? Is, is it because they're richer than they used to be comparatively? Well, yes, that's true. Uh, <laughs> is it um, are there any other reasons? Um, social conservatism, yeah. Um, I think um, I think the next the next election is one that is definitely winnable because I just don't think that many people are tied to that version of the Conservative Party. That is a version of the Conservative Party that is dominated by the Conservative Party members. What about conservatives who voted remain? What about um, conservatives who actually a little bit worried about poverty? What about, you know, conservatives who um, think that racism is a problem? You know, there are, I mean, there's so, so there's quite a lot of um, scope there. And I think that it's for the strategists to decide right, right but I think you can win um, southern seats, but it's got to start, the ground war's got to start now. Um, because um, the reason why, one of the reasons I think why Labour's been in, in opposition so long is just there were these arguments that were lost. So um, was it Ed Balls or someone when they were having that conversation about Labour spent too much in the last Labour government? Well, I don't think they did. It was a financial crisis. Every country is in problem. But they sort of agreed with that Tory narrative. And you've got to win these bigger battles about, you know, the Tory party is corrupt right that's one the cost of living has gone up you know that's a battle they're trying to win um but i think if i can if i'd if i'd um or criticism about Keir Starmer was what you know who are you appealing to you know what I, I don't what this cost of living is that everyone you're going for if you're going for everyone that's kind of well i don't know but i but i, I think there's a huge opportunity to win but uh, I don't, I, I guess what, what I don't, um, a friend of mine who he's in senior, senior sort of civil servant and, you know, he was asked, he actually was, was principal private secretary under Theresa May and he was asked to stay on under Boris and he's sort of seen things come and go um, within um, Downing Street and it's just absolute chaos there. So I think that you know, maybe if someone comes in, they could do a better job. But I think I, I slightly disagree with um, Margaret Hodge. I think he might stay in there because he's going to dig his feet in, isn't he? I, I think <laughs> it depends on how long the how long it takes for the Brexit fairy dust to wear off. You know, I'm not sure that there. I think there are big cultural issues facing Labour in terms of consolidating its electoral pact. But on the other side, there's the cost of living crisis. If that continues. You know further along up to the general election maybe there's a chance you know um price of goods going up you know queues still um coming into the country so i think it depends on what happens with those issues those i would suggest economic issues that will sort of um yeah and so then maybe you can go back to labor you know maybe you can start talking about a fair deal um for everyone and those sorts of idea concepts of fairness that were used in in term um with the third way you know maybe that would um, actually um, be possible. But, you know, it'd be something like a fair deal for all sort of working people, wouldn't it? Because I think that's where they've got to focus is on working people, I think. I think that's uh, and, you know, you can probably, what you could probably say working families as well, if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't, I don't think, I don't think the Labour Party would or should really go that far. But, you know, fair deal for working people. And there's lots of 
you know, um, um, people who are working in work in poverty. I mean, that is yeah, quite, kind of it's an open goal, isn't it? I mean, yeah. hopefully they'll get they'll get up, get there in the end. I agree with you. Listen, it's been amazing to have you. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your um, your expertise and you know and your knowledge on this stuff. And it's great that you're doing the, the research you are. It's really really amazing stuff. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope that's a bit of interest um, yeah. in our little chat, and I'm sure we all really appreciate it. So um, thank you very much indeed for um, for for joining us. Thanks, and... thanks, Joe, and just sort of keep up the good work. And I think, you know, as I was saying before, I think you are in a really good position to sort of play this sort of role that you do in countries like Germany, these sort of groups who just go out and talk to people about issues. You, know, right. you, you could do that. I mean, they don't, they don't have a history really of doing it in the UK, but just owning particular issues, like, for example, in London, um, protection um, of women, you know, by the... <laughs> by the police from the police um you know that's something you could you could sort of go out there and own a little bit and draw people in that way yeah absolutely that's very very true before we, we, everybody goes by the way would you be able to um uh turn on our screens we're going to take a screenshot of everybody um together who's attending so if you could all do that that would be fantastic and i'm going to take a screenshot of you all let me do that so if you all say cheese. Brilliant, thank you very much guys. So yeah, I hope that's been of interest to you. I hope it's been enjoyable. We're gonna have a blog up about the event, a sort of review of what was said. Um, so you can go back and read that and you'll be able to watch the recording. So we'll probably post it in two parts because something went wrong with the recording in the middle. Um, so you can access this again. So yeah, we're gonna um, log off now. So thank you very much for coming um, and keep coming to our events. Thanks very much again, James. Thanks everybody.